There's two kinds of marriages that are difficult and complicated, um, monogamous and non-monogamous. And um, each one has its advantages and its disadvantages, and each one is difficult in its own way. When, when I have couples who come to me and they say, we're thinking of having an open marriage, what do you think? I say, well, the first thing is you, you have to be prepared to have a lot of conversations that are going to be uncomfortable over and over and over again. And if you're not prepared to have endless relationship conversations, open relationship may not be for you. What do you think of the 12-step program, Sexual Addicts? I'm very sympathetic toward people who feel out of control with their sexuality. I'm very sympathetic with people who feel frightened about their sexual impulses and how their sexual decision-making is ruining their own lives or the lives of the people around them. I don't really see that the sex addiction model really helps get to the root of what's troubling people like this. And so the accoutrements of those programs, 12-step uh, meetings and working the steps and all that, I just don't see that providing what people need. There's no differential diagnosis in 12-step programs. When you walk into a room and you say, hi, I'm Joe, I'm a sex addict, everybody says, hey, Joe, come on in, you're a sex addict, like one of us. There's no differential diagnosis. Does this person have obsessive compulsive disorder? Is this person prone to violence? There's no, there's no differential diagnosis. And so the person himself or herself um, may need dramatically different kind of intervention than is available. It's very important that we not get so distracted by the, the content of somebody's obsession or somebody being out of control, which happens to be sexuality in this case. The thing is, sexuality is a very fascinating thing for people to, to get distracted by. So I think that if, uh, if people uh, walk in to someone's office and say, hi, I'm an addict, I spend a lot of money on cigars, you know, most people, I say, oh, well, Jay, that's kind of interesting. Someone comes in and says, I just can't stop going to hookers. Everybody's paying attention. When you see American media capitalizing on this. Tiger Woods gets up there, does a mea culpa, I'm a sex addict. What does that make you feel as a professional? Well, the American media, when it comes to sexuality, they have figured out how to have it both ways. What the American media do is, they broadcast a lot of sleazy stuff about sex, but they put it in the context of, isn't this terrible? So what the American media will do is they will have shows on teenage prostitutes. And so they get to show 16-year-old girls in skimpy outfits, but they put it in the context of, isn't this terrible? So the American media is terribly exploitive when it comes to sexuality and people's sexual problems. Oprah has made a career out of this. Dr. Phil does this. And so what we see is things like Tiger Woods or other celebrities they come on TV and the media loves this because the media gets to have a story of, oh, prostitution and group sex and orgies and all this kind of unprotected sex. And isn't this terrible? If the American media really thought it was so terrible, they wouldn't give it so much airtime. One of the key messages in American culture is that sex is dangerous. Sex is not dangerous. Bad sexual decision making is dangerous. Bad decision making in general is dangerous. Most Americans do not have a sufficient vocabulary with which to talk about sexuality. They're still talking about down there. They're still talking about, you know. They're still talking about doing it. So uh, I don't think of America as being open about sexuality in a healthy way. I think of America as sort of an obsessive, adolescent kind of society that um, likes to trip over sex as often as possible, but doesn't like to really invite it into the table to actually sit down and have a cup of coffee with it. You know, what's really driving the sex addiction movement is a combination of America's discomfort with sexuality and a profound misunderstanding of sexual behavior and sexual decision making on the part of both professionals and lay people in the United States. The American public would be shocked to know how little training 
American psychologists get in sexuality. So, you know, you can become a marriage counselor or social worker or psychiatrist or psychologist without ever knowing how common is it that people have anal sex or how common is it that people like to be spanked. So the American uh, profession of psychology and social work and, and psychiatry was so ignorant about sexuality that in 1986, when this new idea came along, um, they, they mostly just said, oh, okay, I, I guess that's a thing. You know, somebody gets up and says, I like to be spanked, I'm a sex addict, and everybody thinks, oh my God, this guy likes to be spanked, he's a sex addict. I mean, there's like 30, 40 million Americans who are spanked on any given weekend uh, in their own bedrooms, but it's not part of the general consciousness. Do you think that America's peculiar attitude, this sort of like obsessive look at sex, has something to do with the fact that this country's still a religious country? Where do people get their ideas about sex? A lot of people get their ideas about sex from their early religious training. The idea that their bodies are somehow shameful or dirty. The idea that um, if you have sex before holy matrimony, somehow God is angry with you. These ideas, they pile up. And what I hear people saying is that they really do believe that God really cares about which orifice they, they put their finger in, you know? The, I know a lot of people who are feeling terrified that God is angry with them that they masturbate. A lot of people, they, they actually think that God, who, you know, is in charge of the Pacific Ocean and global warming and a lot of other things, actually cares do you put your penis in someone's vagina? Do you put your penis in somebody's mouth? Do you let somebody put their finger in your anus? Um, and, and when people believe that God cares about their sexuality, what that means is that everybody is just one misstep away from hell. And that's a very dangerous thing to do to people's sexuality, to persuade them that there's a normal way and a not normal way, and that the stakes are eternal damnation. That's very serious stuff. And most clergy get no training in sexuality. Most clergy are not willing to talk about how difficult it is to be in a long-term monogamous relationship. 